As a visually impaired person, running is something that anybody can do. Your sighted guides become a social outlet for you. You become less isolated. It's kind of a natural outlet for people who are not necessarily previously runners where it's something they can do. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 141 of the Running For Real podcast. This is episode two of the Beyond Running series. Thank you for being here today. Now, you know that I enjoy our conversations on Fridays. I hope you do too. And lots of you have been emailing me saying that you can see me going through changes as my world is opening. And hopefully it's also encouraging you to think differently too. But I also get a lot of messages from runners and people like you who listen to me who are not in such a great place. They're trying so hard to figure something out that is bothering them, but they can't find the answer. Google is making it worse and they just feel alone. I felt that way with my amenorrhea and I hate the idea of others feeling that way. So it's hard and I've been thinking about it for a while and I want to address some of these issues. Maybe they won't be massive episodes that people share about for weeks as so inspiring. Maybe they won't be ones that focus on running, but they will allow us, you and I, the opportunity to learn. I think about the perspectives, the lens that we have always lived through and this can allow us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Not just that, but also understand what we say, how we can act towards those who are struggling with something, but it's not talked about for one reason or another. We also know how to treat those people so we don't ignore them or you know, dodge the subject altogether because it makes them feel worse. My hope with these bonus episodes is that during the next eight weeks, we, we learn. We learn compassion, we learn understanding, and, and we grow from it. Even if the topic doesn't pertain to you in any way and no one you know is going through this, I hope you will consider listening to these, especially as these episodes are shorter, we can learn and grow as people are continuing to share their stories and just educate us on things that we need to hear, really. There are no sponsors for these episodes because I just want them out there. I want to hopefully ease some of the struggle for those working through it and I want to make people feel better and feel like they can be confident in who they are. All I ask, if you do appreciate these, you consider supporting me on Patreon. Your few dollars, pounds, euros, lira can go a long way and you'll get bonus interviews. You'll get to know upcoming guests in advance. So you can ask your questions to those guests. And I really appreciate the support to any of you who already have signed up and do support me every month. You know that I share lots of bonus things with you in there. You can find out more at patreon.com forward slash running for real. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash running for real with the number four. Now, episode two of this Beyond Running series is Rich Hunter. And I do have an announcement for you in this episode too. So listen out for that. But this episode is not about me. Today, we're talking about visual impairments, especially for runners, but it will apply to everyone. Rich Hunter is the founder of United in Stride. He connects volunteer sighted guides with blind runners and has set up the USA Blind Athletes Championships. We're going to talk about that. And also, if you want to volunteer to be a guide for a race, I've had many of you talking about this, you will find out how to do that. Rich has an amazing story, and I actually wasn't able to get all of it in because I wanted to keep that focus on the visual impairment aspect and what we can do. But I think I will record a bonus interview with Rich in the future because it's definitely worth hearing. All right, let's go meet Rich. Rich, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I am excited that you're here. I am, I've really enjoyed getting to know you over the past few months and looking forward to seeing you in a few months, which we will talk about soon. But welcome to the podcast. I'm glad, happy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. And, um, you know, th- this episode, we are going to be uh, focusing on running as a visually impaired runner. Uh, we are doing this series of kind of topics that are often left unspoken about and I want to kind of break the stigma with a lot of these things but first I want to go into your story a little bit as it is very interesting with the kind of directions that you've taken the things that you've done 
you were a school psychologist and lecturer, which I am fascinated with psychology. So that in itself, I could ask you a lot of questions. But the main thing that the main reason I've interacted with you is um, you were kind of the leading force behind the development of United in Stride, which is an online uh, database to unite volunteer sighted guides and blind runners across North America. So tell us about, you know, what led you to there going from a school psychologist and lecturer to um, kind of being the, the, the main person pushing this United in Stride and, and, and what made you decide to do that? Boy, that's, uh, that's actually a, a long story, so I will, I will try to tighten it up a, li- a little bit for you. Yep. Um, I have a degenerative eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa, mm-hmm. and so it's a type of vision loss that where you first lose your peripheral vision, and then for some of us, we also lose our central vision, and it's a progressive condition, which I was diagnosed with when I was in the Marines, um, but after I was uh, medically discharged because of my eye disease from the Marine Corps way back when, I ended up becoming a school psychologist. And I was working as a school psychologist for about 10 years, and I had a real rapid rate of vision loss back then as a result of my eye condition, literally going from needing no accommodations whatsoever to needing to learn some basic Braille, how to use a white cane, how to use a talking computer, et cetera. And I lost the ability to drive. And I unfortunately ended up leaving that profession as a result of my vision loss and and not really being able to um, do the tasks required of my job. And so I found myself in this position of focusing on, well, what can I do instead of focusing on what I can't do? And I have daughters and I had to think about setting the example for them that one still can be relevant and set ambitious goals in spite of adversity. I didn't want them to see me as a father of receiving such a terrible diagnosis and going blind and that I was depressed and I was on the couch. So I wanted to, you know, be a positive role model. And, you know, back then I just said, you know, I like, well, I like to run. Could I qualify for the Boston Marathon? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I had to take a lot of time off to qualify as an age grouper from my only one and only marathon before that. And at the time when I was new to vision loss, I did not know a single other person with vision loss, let alone people who are on this endurance sports Mm -hmm. journey. And there's just a sequence of things that kind of happened through that from me reaching out to the California International Marathon about adding the visually impaired division and all that, where what I came to learn through my journey as serving as a resource to others and through my own sports journey was that they're just that we weren't that well connected, that people were having a real difficult time finding the necessary resources and just being able to go outside Mm -hmm. and run. Because when you have vision loss, if it's severe enough, you are either stuck on a treadmill or you're running by yourself, which can be very dangerous in some circumstances, or you don't run at all. Mm -hmm. And would you say, just while we're on that topic, for runners who are visually impaired, is it more often a case of they had something like you, a degenerative um, condition, and it kind of, they started out as runners and then kind of maybe took a bit of time off while they adjusted and then got back to it? Or is is it more people who have had maybe a uh, vision loss their entire lives and have just kind of been grown up in that kind of, um, I'm not letting anything stop me kind of method? Is there is there more more one or the other, or is it just kind of a mix? Everything, all the above when Mm. it comes to the the journeys of visually impaired runners. I mean, there's, I would say the most common type of vision loss, you know, when people are visually impaired, they have some sort of degenerative um, condition, but someone like me, for example, you know, your, your, your listeners can't see me, but I'm not the typical runner. I'm six foot one and I'm 230 pounds but my PR marathon is a three seventeen. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't, I didn't grow up as someone who liked to run. In fact, I used to hate running when I was, when I was a little kid, it was, it was like punishment to, to make one run. But what I found in, in my particular case, and I think what other people find is that as a visually impaired person, running is something that anybody can do. It's not expensive. When you have a sighted guide, your sighted guides become a social out, 
let mm-hmm. for you. You become less isolated. There's so much, um, unfortunately, so many people in the visually impaired community that are not physically active that there's, you know, tendency towards, you know, people being overweight and, uh, and, and needing more exercise. But, you know, a lot of people just haven't had them had it modeled for them mm-hmm. and they don't have the resources and people to come alongside them. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a natural outlet for people who are not necessarily previously runners mm-hmm. where it's something, something they can do. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. So let's start right at the kind of big picture, the, 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 maybe the elephant in the room, if you want. Okay. So we've been using the term, uh, runners who are visually impaired athletes with, with visual impairments for someone listening, like what are the terms you should you should be using or or people feel comfortable with what things should they kind of avoid doing just for someone who's never really interacted with someone who has any kind of, uh, visual impairment at all. Like what, what would, what would they want to be aware of doing not just in the words that they use, but what they, how they act towards that person. Um, the term visually impaired is probably the most universally accepted word, like a person with vision impairment. A lot of people who are visually impaired also, are okay with the word blind and they own the word blind. It just depends on their own stage of vision loss because you have to realize that there's people who've been blind their entire lives and, you know, they're self-actualized blind people. They're, you know, they would be, you know, traveling to the Amazon, kayaking, climbing mountains, doing all these things that even I wouldn't do raising families, holding jobs, engineers, doctors. I mean, you, you name it. Mm -hmm. There's people at kind of that level. And then there's, you know, elderly people. There's a lot of elderly people who have age related vision loss and losing their vision is terrifying, you know, losing the freedom and, uh, and losing all that independence. And then there's parents who have children who are diagnosed with some sort of vision problem or who are blind who are frightened about that. And then they shelter their young children a little bit too much because they're afraid they're going to get hurt Mm -hmm. and, uh, and protect them that way. So it, it, in, in my particular case, I'm a very open person. I want to be basically the ambassador of the white cane or my, my guide dog or whatever that people, when they see me that, um, I'm, I'm open and accepting and probably the, the saddest sort of situations are for me are these situations in which people are kind of afraid, uh, or just completely avoid you as a visually impaired person. And I'll I'll give you a, a real, a real classic example. That was probably one of my saddest experiences. I was new to walking around with my white cane when I was adjusting to vision loss Mm -hmm. and there was a mother and a son and they were walking towards me on the sidewalk and I still had enough vision that I could see them coming. I could see all of this because, you know, vision loss is a continuum. Mm -hmm. You know, there's legal blindness, clear up to totally blind and this, they were walking towards me and the boy asked his mother, he says, what is that man doing? Because he could see me walk with my white cane and it was going back and forth in front of me. And the mother is like, "Shh, shh, 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 be quiet you know, and she shushed her son and it just broke my heart because she was teaching her child to be afraid mm. of someone with a disability. Mm-hmm. What would have been so appropriate for her to say, Oh, that man's blind and that's his white cane. And that's, you know, what he uses to, to move around safely or, or whatever, you know, s- something along those lines. And I also, as a, as a person with a disability, and I, this is very common, a very high percentage of people with disabilities um, would report that they feel invisible because people are so uncomfortable around disabilities. They don't know what to say. They're afraid they're going to do something wrong, that they will literally go out of their way to avoid you, including crossing the street. So what, one of the most most dramatic examples of that for me was I had just completed a half Ironman. I was treated like a rock star at this race. People were coming up and getting my signature, wanting their pictures with me. The next day I had a doctor's appointment and I was walking towards someone and uh, they literally, it, they crossed way out of the way so they wouldn't have to cross my path. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's so hard. And, and that's exactly the kind of reason I wanted to to bring episodes like this out because you know, people maybe think that they're doing what's helpful or 
they obviously don't realize, you know, maybe forget that there's a, there's a person in there. So for someone who maybe you mentioned about someone saying the wrong thing, if someone is talking to someone with a visual impairment and does find themselves saying the wrong thing, saying something that puts their foot in the mouth. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in many situations where it's something that is uncomfortable or something maybe that is different about that person, that if you kind of keep going, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that, I should have said this, and, and rambling on and kind of keep drawing attention to the point, it, it makes it worse because you're just kind of making it a bigger deal than it is. Um, you know, everyone knows that people say things that they, you know, when they don't know the situation, is it better just to kind of like, sorry, and then move on? What would, what would be your advice if someone does find themselves saying the wrong, the wrong words and wanting to redeem themselves, I guess? I, I think the biggest problem is the anxiety about saying the wrong things. Yeah. Because if, if somebody's worried about saying the wrong thing, then they're not even going to develop a friendship with me or yeah. talk to me or anything. And then I'm going to be one of the 90% of the disabled people out there that can feel very invisible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think people, if they just look at a person with a disability, including a person with vision loss, and they just talk to them as they though they would anyone else, yep. you know, in terms of, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to greet someone when they walk in the room, do the same for the person with the disability, um, and not, and really not worry too much about the language. Unfortunately, I have to say there's, you know, even among my peers, there's, you know, there's, there's grumpy blind people just sort of like there are grumpy other people. <laughs> and, and if you do have a, you know, an encounter with someone that seems to be easily offended, don't, don't take that as a, you know, like, oh, all blind people are these grumpy people. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, um, but yeah, I would just, I would just, if you just think of us as just being, you know, just like anyone else, that's how we want to be treated. Absolutely. No, thank you for explaining that. And I think I have, I have an example, obviously much less, but um, as a, as a British person, people always think I have this, you know, this stupid phrase of stiff off a lift and um, hide my feelings, which I am the complete, I'm like a marshmallow, so soft. I say everything I'm thinking. So yeah, we all have these stereotypes. We all have these things. So if you want to generalize an entire group of people, it's so easy to do it based on one person, but not the truth. So, okay, let's talk about your story a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the um, RP, which um, you was your de degenerative you know, visual impairment that kind of continued over time. You mentioned you have two little girls or two girls. Um, yeah, three. And three girls. Okay. And mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how did you, as this was happening, you, you mentioned how scary it is to lose your sight or for someone, in an elderly person to lose their sight. But for you not being elderly, that must have been even more scary because once you get to a certain age, you know, maybe you think, okay, things are going to start breaking down. But for you having it happen early on and having these girls in your life, how were you scared and how did you kind of, did you decide you wanted to hold it together and not let them see that fear or did you let them see your guard down? How did you handle it? You know, it's, I wanted to, my children to see me being physically active, that they saw me um, volunteering and making a difference in the community and just basically living my life. Um, because they could obviously things had, have changed for me and they continue to, you know, I'm, I'm still adjusting to vision loss because my vision, um, continues to, uh, deteriorate. Yeah. Um, I remember the very first time I was interviewed for a newspaper article, my, my oldest daughter is now 22. She was in early elementary school and, and the sports writer wanted to talk to my daughter about her dad who was losing his vision. And I didn't script my daughter. I prepped her like anyone would for the type of questions someone might ask her, but I didn't, I even left the room when she was being interviewed. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions the, the sports writer asked is like, well, are you afraid of losing your vision like your dad? Because it is considered a hereditary disease. Mm -hmm. We've learned more about it and it wouldn't necessarily cause them vision problems as it turns out. But this young daughter of mine she, she responds, well, I don't think that's going to happen, but if it does, I will do the best that I can. <laughs> so what, what a beautiful testimony yeah. 
that I was doing something right and mm-hmm. setting the right kind of example that my children did not fear vision loss. Mm-hmm. And, you, and, and one, of the, one of the real interesting things that I could never have comprehended, even though one of my early retinal specialists told me this would be the case, and I've seen it in the daughters, as, especially of other people with degenerative um, vision loss, like some of my peers, is our children develop an amazing level of empathy mm-hmm. and compassion for other people. Mm-hmm. They, because they, they do, my, my daughters do assist me. There's things that I can't see where you need eyeballs to do certain tasks. And they're just intuitive in all these years in their ability to like um, be able to anticipate those things and just just come up alongside me when we're walking somewhere or something. And they've developed this compassion and empathy for other people, uh, which which I think is is lovely. Yeah, sure. So special. And for someone listening now who maybe is going through this right now, um, starting to lose their sight, their whether it's, you know, um, as they're getting older, whether it's some kind of degenerative, you know, RP or something like that, what would be your advice to someone listening who is feeling scared right now? You know, I think that sometimes people like me, someone will see me as like, oh, this guy's done a hundred mile race. He's ran all these marathons. He's done Ironman. And I could never wet up to that. You know, I could never, I could never accomplish that if, you know, someone like me is, example in that way. But the thing is, is I had a starting place. I mean, when I was first diagnosed with my eye condition, I couldn't even think long-term. There were lots of freedoms that were taken away from me. I wanted to be a Marine Corps officer and it only lasted a year because of this eye disease. And I, I had a do over. Mm -hmm. I lost, you know, I had this fear of losing the, losing my driver's license and my, my chosen profession. And I did lose my driver's license. So I've been through all these different types of, you know, stressors and everything else. And I think what I've learned is when you're going through any type of condition, it doesn't have to be vision loss, but you have to be okay with the fact that, you know what, you're going to have some bad days. Mm-hmm. You, you might have some temporary depression, not as long as you don't get stuck there. You know, if you get stuck there, then you're going to need to have help. But it is it is definitely a transition. And with the right supports, with the right training, you can move through it. And for, you know, this is a running podcast. So your listeners are running. Running is something I like to do. But if you have a grandparent, a grandmother, for example, who's losing their vision, they might be passionate about cooking. Well, there's people who cook extraordinarily well who are blind and their goal might be, I want to prepare a Thanksgiving dinner for my family. There's blind people, you know, like, let's say they sew. You can still learn to sew as a blind person. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just a matter of a, a person with vision loss, giving themselves permission to grieve, and then trying to engage a goal of like, you know, what is it that I like to enjoy? What, what are my passions? And then figuring out a way how you can engage in that passion, whether it's running or something else. Can I just interrupt you there with, with that passion? Could it be, is it likely to be this finding a new way of doing something that you always loved or sometimes is, or at least in the in an initial, is that too painful to go back to something because you're constantly kind of, I'm kind of thinking of it in, comparative to the way that are running after you have a big injury if you go back you're just comparing to before this isn't like before uh so if someone goes back to the same passion is it is this a good time to maybe try something new something that you've always thought about doing because you have nothing to compare to or in your kind of experience is it good to kind of find a new way of doing the thing you were loving before i think it could be both of those things and in the in the case of vision loss you know, people would be shocked to see the sort of things that blind people can do who are totally blind and deaf. I have, I have a mosaic. It's an incredible mosaic, um, on my wall in our guest room upstairs. And it was created by someone who was totally blind. And I remember at one time I could still see it. It's like, how in the world does she even choose those colors? How did, how, I mean, so people can find a way to, 
if they really love something, it might take them longer. They might have to do it in a different way. But there's also going to be people that can explore new things. There's tons of examples of people who are doing things right now that they never did before until they're blind. I have a friend who was formerly not even an athlete or anything. He lives out in the, in the middle of the country um, on a farm. And when he became blind and was introduced to sports, he ended up being the first totally blind guy to kayak all the way down through the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River mm. in, an, in his own kayak. And now he's teaching other blinded veterans mm. how to kayak. So he learned, he definitely had to learn something new. And some of these yeah. people are mountain climbing and, oh. and, and uh, you know, blind kids going to school to become engineers. And, you know, I have a friend that's, uh, that's a runner who is in a PhD program in Southern California. And he's literally working with satellites to help measure carbon emissions. Mm, that's so, cool. so, so I don't think we should limit our, you know, future goals or what we can or can do based on whatever our disabilities. I can't drive. That's one thing I know I can't do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. But I'm sure you found other ways around kind of that situation as, as will everyone here. And any more yeah. pieces of advice for a loved one who is maybe wants to be there for someone, um, but just maybe is getting the vibe. And I know this would be me, um, that they're kind of smothering that person or kind of need to back off. And, and what would be your advice for someone who, you know, maybe is seeing their loved one struggling and feeling a bit depressed and, they aren't sure what to do. What would be your advice? When I think, when I think about that question, I think a, a little bit about children in particular. Children are incredibly resilient mm -hmm. and let the children explore and try not to transfer your fears of them getting hurt onto them. And if anything, you know, try to figure out ways where they can become as independent as possible. There's there's this, uh, this older gentleman who was diagnosed with an eye condition called Stargardt's when he was a little boy. And this man's well into his 70s now, maybe even 80 years old. And um, when he was first told that he was going to lose his vision, at that time, the doctor told the father, you know, the, the world is much too dangerous for your son. The best thing you could do for your son is to take him home and not let him go outside. Oh. And the father looks at his son when they get home and they said, you hear what the doctor said? and and the son said, yes. He goes, I don't want you to listen to a single word that that man said. His dad told him to go outside and mow the lawn. And Charlie comes back in after doing a terrible job, all random and everything. And he said, you didn't do it well enough. You need to mow the lawn for real. And Charlie had to figure out a way to mow the lawn. And so he ended up on his own, figuring it out, taking out buckets and literally set a bucket down so he knew where he started put another bucket at the other end of the lawn so he could finish and he knew where to start to go back down. He would move these two buckets across his lawn until he could figure out how to, how to mow the lawn. So let your kids explore and figure things out and be a kid just like everyone else. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Great, great advice there. All right. So related to that kind of letting people explore, you told me, through email about something that happened when you were on a tandem bike training for your second Ironman. You were hit but head on by a elderly lady um, waking up inside of her car after flying through yeah. her windshield back first, which I just, oh, my heart crushes just thinking about that. Um, but, you know, you you ended up in, on, in a helicopter on your way to the hospital, ended up in a neck brace in a hospital bed for a month. But you still ended up running a marathon uh, just over five months after your accident, running Boston nine months after, and Alcatraz swimming Al Alcatraz not eleven months after. Like for someone listening who is thinking, how can I? How, I I'm too scared to let my loved one out, or I want to encourage discourage them from going out and and during training because you you sharing that story, that's the exact thing that they fear. So what would be your counter argument to that? To encourage this person listening that a loved one or to the person listening who is visually impaired to go out there and do it despite yes there being some risks well in, in that particular case i was just like anybody else i was out doing something i loved and i was on my tandem bicycle and so there's inherent risk to all of us in 
anything we do, but if, but I love being outdoors Mm -hmm. and the person I was in an accident with, he has been an angel in my life. I, he's, he's, uh, he's a very close friend and I, and I, I met him through him being a guide and he was, he was a, he was a very good friend. And you know, it's interesting about that particular experience is it's, you know, when it was after journeying through it, my life is even more full than it was before. Mm-hmm. As strange as, as strange as that, as it sounds, because when I was sitting in that hospital bed and I'd done, you know, a fair amount of speaking about, you know, overcoming adversity, you know, and losing my vision and still doing all the things that I do. But when I was laying in the hospital bed and that neck brace and with all these lacerations and, and everything else, I said, well, 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 my prescription of focusing what I focusing on, what can I do work for this? And literally there were times when I was in that hospital bed where I'm like, okay, well focus on what, what can I do? Mm-hmm. And there was a second, there were, there were moments in there where, what can I do right now? It was literally to take a breath. It was to breathe. And then it was learning to use the accessibility features on my iPhone. And I've been surrounded by such amazing role models because of all the volunteer work I do in the country and hosting the marathon championships for the visually impaired and my connections with all these amazing blinded veterans that I, that I see their perseverance in spite of their injuries, you know, and what they can do and what they can overcome. And that whole journey and my recovery from that became a like, okay, I want to pay honor to the people that have been through so much worse than me. I need, I need a purpose beyond myself. This is an adversity situation. I'm going to focus on what I can do. And in the process, I'm still going to help other people. I mean, I was literally on the phone within two days of my accident, calling the U S association of blind athletes and saying, I'm still going to coordinate the marathon national championships. And I was sitting in my hospital bed making phone calls, planning this event, because I lead that event Mm -hmm. and, and I love running and I wanted to run in that event. And it gave me such a beautiful, tangible goal that I, that I would have purpose beyond my pain in training to be able to run that marathon five months and three days after my accident. Mm -hmm. And the, and the crazy thing was, is that I did it. And what I didn't realize was that the impact that would have on some other people is they were looking at their own, you know, their own situations and way worse situations that I was in. And then they, then they thought, wow, okay, what, what can I do? I, how, how do I overcome this injury? Because I want to run too. I have this goal event. So one of the, one of the things I think people have to realize is that there is a 100% chance that every single one of your listeners is going to go through some sort of adversity. It's not going to be necessarily my adversity, mm-hmm. but they will face adversity. So the, the idea of insulating someone from risk at all to protect them from adversity, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So, so the best that we can do is to equip, equip those around us. If it's children in our charge or whatever is to help them develop the skills, come alongside them, give them the scaffolding they need to be able to learn how to be a person who can persevere and who can live life with purpose and passion regardless of what comes our way. Mm-hmm. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and for giving us such a real example of that. You are absolutely embodying that in every way. All right. So just to wrap up here, um, you've mentioned about the, um, the championships that are at CIM. You've said that, um, and I haven't actually announced it. So Rich, we're going to make this my announcement that I am <laughs> Um, <laughs> I am, uh, guide running as a guide this year. I'm very excited to be doing it, coming out, going out to CIM. Haven't told people that there, so you are hearing it and I'm absolutely honored and 
I'm really excited about it, Rich. I don't know if you if you know just how excited I am, but I've been telling pretty much everyone I uh, speak to and everyone is just so excited. And for that reason, everyone that I've spoken to about it has just been like, how do I do that? I want to do something like that. That sounds amazing. And obviously awesome. they're not talking about like flying across the country um, for a weekend, but like at their local events, for someone listening who thinks, wow, I, re- I would love to be a guide. I've always wanted to do that. What other races are available? Let's say it's someone who lives outside of the US or somewhere on the East Coast. How can someone find out whether they have the opportunity to do that and, and learn more um, if that's something that catches their interest? Well, one of, the, uh, one of the best ways, if someone's primary interest is in guiding in a race, is to actually help a visually impaired person train in a race. Mm-hmm. And so because I saw this huge need and all this volunteer work I've done for so many years now. Um, I'm actually the founder of the resource you previously mentioned called United in Stride. So it's www.unitedinstride.com. And because what I learned along the way is that there just aren't enough sighted guides for the visually impaired runners out there. And I'm a firm believer that there are visually impaired people in every community across the United States that would be willing to get out, power walk, and jog and run if they heard about United and Stride, knew that they had the resources to get outside and off a treadmill or to lace up shoes for the first time. And it's really pretty simple. You just go to the website and you create a profile and it has a zip code find a partner function. So once you're logged into the system, um, you can put in your zip code and then you can search out a certain mile. I'd, I'd suggest 50 miles out so it captures some of the lower miles. Mm-hmm. And then you can connect with people through the system. And even if there's nobody in your area yet, if you're the first one, so when that visually impaired runner does move into the community or um, maybe they're vacationing, visiting family in the area, they will go to United and Stride. They'll enter the zip code for whatever your town is, Dayton, Ohio, or Sacramento, California, you enter the zip code of your, you know, the visually impaired person in the hotel, and they're like, oh, wow, there's people in the system I can reach out to to run with while I'm here visiting. Great. Okay, awesome. So I will definitely have a link in the show notes for anyone to go there. Let's go there. That's United in Stride um, again. And you mentioned the marathon championships in Sacramento. Yeah. Now, I'm assuming this being September, it's too late for someone to sign up because they would have to be entered so it would have to be someone who's already entered in the race, correct? Well, th- that's what, not necessarily that like there's, okay. well, even with the California International Marathon, I'm constant. I get contacted with people all over the country that have an interest in being in the, in the CIM. And I always recruit new guides every year to be part of the California International Marathon. And if somebody wants to guide, they can still register through me as, as a guide for that. But there are other races in the country. And every every single race out there, if you have a visually impaired runner, there's people running 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons and marathons. But some of the biggies like the Boston Marathon, the New York City Marathon with Achilles, Chicago Marathon, um, Buffalo, New York Marathon, San Francisco um, there's all these, you know, there's, there's definitely some organized groups in different places around the country. Okay. Um, yeah. Houston. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I will. Um, and I'm assuming you have some information on that on United and Stride as well. There's various tabs at the top okay. of United Stride for different races. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Um, I was, I think we'll just do two of the, um, running through final questions just because I really wanted to get yeah. the most out of this conversation with you today. So firstly, one piece of advice you'd like to give the listeners for life. Oh boy. (laughs) You know, for me, it's, if you can align your passion and your gift and your gifts in service to other people, amazing things can happen. Mm. And that's, that's what I choose to do through my service work and running and trying to have an impact on people around the country. Well, you were absolutely doing that. So thank you so much, Rich. And finally, uh, a running for real moment, something that only runners will understand. Well, you know, one of the crazy things that I find is that there's so many people out there that think that uh, they can't run a marathon Mm -hmm. or a half marathon. And they're stuck at that. Everybody, three miles is hard for everybody. And all I can say is that stepping it up to the next level is not as hard as people think. If, if, 
if I can run 100 miles, and the longest run I ever did before that was 50 miles, and I had 50 miles of uncharted territory Mm -hmm. to negotiate and can my body do this, Mm -hmm. I am 100% confident that your listeners, if they're kind of stuck in that 5K, 10K, half marathon rut, they can finish a marathon. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I just, I know this is a different example because she is an elite runner, but I just want to give the other example that I heard recently, um, Claire Gallagher, who won Western States 100 mile, 100 mile. She, uh, her long runs are about uh, 20, I think she said 20 to 24 miles long. Oh no, no, sorry. They were 30 miles long. So around 30 miles long. And she somehow manages to pull out another 50 miles on race day and, and win the race. So you know, I guess she's an elite, but at the same time, that shows you how amazing the body is that it can, it can find that. And, and you saying, you know, finding 50 miles, that's just how amazing our bodies are. So Rich, thank you so much for your time, for just being honest and open with us and for just being a, a bright light in this world. We, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, EA, iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to that episode with Rich Hunter. I hope you enjoyed it. And when we talk about being visually impaired, I'm sure we all know someone who is or who will in the future. So we can refer back to this episode. We can think about what Rich said about feeling invisible if you see someone or interact with someone. And think about, have you been guilty of avoiding situations connecting with someone with a disability? I know this made me think differently about the future and what I could have done in the past to make someone feel more valued. Now, you know, I appreciate you and I wanted to make sure these episodes were focused on the topic at hand. That is why there is no sponsors. However, if you wouldn't mind supporting me on Patreon to show that you appreciate me spending the time to do these episodes, you can support me by going to patreon.com forward slash running for real with the number four. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash running for real with the number four. You can sign up there and just a few dollars, pounds, lira, anything a month can go a long way. Now, on Friday, you will be hearing my live show with Meb Kafleski, Jenny Simpson, and Rachel Patton. So subscribe if you haven't already. Go listen to that live show in the New York Roadrunners Run Center on Friday. And next Monday, I will have Shelley Gordon, who's going to be talking about a topic that really got this series into my mind, suicide. It's a heartbreaking topic, but just talking about it and knowing what you can do for your loved ones if they are struggling can make the biggest difference in the world, literally. Hope you have a great week. I'll see you Friday. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.